All right, everyone, welcome. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Welcome to the Community Foundation Virtual Roundtable for Community Foundation CEOs. We are covering the topic of impact investing. This is our part two conversation. If you missed part one, it is available on our website and ready for you to see. Um, there's lots of great content and great conversation, and we're super thankful for the folks that are here joining us for part two. And for the folks that did not see the first discussion, we definitely encourage you to go back and watch. Um, I wanted to just go through just a few reminders for everyone. Please enable video if you're able to. Um, please edit your name to add your foundation name and your pronouns. You could do that by hovering over your name by clicking on participants. And to please utilize the Zoom hand raise to ask any questions and our chat function. We can keep track of any questions that you have. If we don't get to any of the questions, we can follow up via email. So definitely make sure that you send in your questions before you leave the room today. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Eric Kazempa. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Daniela. And again, yes, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate your involvement and input. And um, uh, I'm Eric Kazempa and I'm with the Longmont Community Foundation. And I'm proud to be joined by Christy Naus of the CEO Net Board and president of the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines and Daniela rodriguez Ramp, Director of Leadership Development and Training for the Council of Foundations. Also, she is joined by our colleagues, Jill and Caroline, as part of the team. So we're really grateful for their um, involvement. We're joined by our discussants, um, Deb Markley, Senior Vice President of Locus Impact Investing, who wasn't able to join us at the last one, but will be uh, here to, to share and to also uh, give you her insights in impact investing. Um, Susan Hamill, Executive in Residence with the Minnesota Council of Foundations and Stuart Comstock Gay, President and CEO of the Delaware Community Foundation. And both of those uh, discussants were with us last time and we'll of course delve a little deeply into their knowledge about impact investing. Um, we're gonna go into deeper dive. Obviously this is a chance to um, get beyond the basics to really talk about engaging with donors, identifying partners, avoiding pitfalls. Don't worry, we're gonna get into stories about some pitfalls and challenges and what tips and tricks and landmines to, landmines to possibly avoid. Um, we're gonna leave ample time. This is a very informal discussion. So we're gonna leave ample time for your questions. We'll be checking the chat. We'll be uh, looking for you to chime in with your comments. Um, so please use the chat along the way. And now I wanna turn it over to Christy, who's gonna get us started. Thanks. Great, thanks, Eric. And it's been wonderful to work in partnership with you and with you, Daniela, and look forward to continuing that between the Council of Foundations and CEO Net for sure. Uh, did just want to start today by letting our discussants, again, I don't know if that's a word, but we use it a lot here, um, take a minute to tell you more about themselves, their experience with impact in investing, and specifically, and I don't know, Deb and Susan, if this, um, relates to you quite as much, but you can sure talk about what you're seeing out there. But Stu, um, you know, talk a little bit about whether or not um, in your impact investing program, this is like a portion of your um, unrestricted fund portfolio, or is this something that donors have contributed to, you know, a little bit about that as you're introducing yourself so we can kind of get a picture of what it looks like in your shop or where you've worked before. Deb, you weren't with us. So thank you for being here now. I'm looking at the corner of the screen where you should be. And um, I wanna give you just a little more time to help us know more about your experience since um, Susan and Stu were on the call with us uh, last time. And also reflect that um, Marsha Hope was with us last time and is not able to be here this time. So you'll be one of, if you haven't seen the video or you weren't there, you'll wanna watch her uh, from last time. Deb. Thanks, Christy. Um, and thanks, it's great to be with all of you, I'm sorry I couldn't be it with the um, with you for the first part of this conversation, um, but understand that Marcia did a really great job. Um, I am uh, with an organization called Locus Impact Investing, and we are a philanthropic consultancy and mission-driven investment advisory firm. We work with um, philanthropy and um, other impact investors to partner with their communities to advance more equitable economic development. And that partnering with communities is a pretty big value statement that we have to the work that, that we do. Um, I lead the philanthropic consulting work that, Co that Locus does, and we work with both private and public foundations to help them both 
educate and build the commitment to do local impact investing, then to develop the tools, the policies, the processes, the systems they need to actually implement that strategy. And then with my other colleagues at Locus, we actually can provide transaction support, due diligence and underwriting, um, asset servicing, and we even do fund uh, design and, and management. So we, we um, have put together a team that really can be a long-term partner with uh, philanthropy interested in building their local impact investing um, work on the ground. We have a particular focus on community foundations, a commitment to really grow the community foundation local investing movement. And, mm -hmm. and we do see it as a movement. We see an increasing number of community foundations stepping into this role as an extension of their um, community leadership. You might call it community stewardship of their, um, their assets and their resources. Um, I, I don't think it's something that has just been spurred by uh, the last couple of years and the, the crises that we find ourselves in. I think this is the beginning of, of an arc of a movement. Um, mm -hmm. And we do an awful lot of work with community foundations one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but we also have been involved in uh, several peer cohorts, including the work in Kansas. That's how we got to work with Marsha Pope at the Topeka Community Foundation and help them build their, their strategy and implementation tools. We are also working with the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance and four foundations in an accelerator process to take them through the process of um, building their strategy and getting to a board decision on this. And so I bring that perspective of our community foundation and other foundation partners to this conversation. Um, and I'm happy to share stories and um, insights as we go along. So really excited to, uh, to be part of this conversation. Well, thank you for making time. Susan, you've got just such a wealth of experience as well. Tell us a little more about you and help us get a frame for where you're coming in today. Absolutely, Christy, thank you. I'm Susan Hamill, executive in residence, the Minnesota Council and Foundations and uh, founder president of Cogent Consulting for Public Benefit Corporation, Impact Investing Advisor. Got my start in impact investing in Newark, New Jersey, uh, where I worked for Prudential and I got my CFA, my chartered financial analyst. And I started asking a lot of pesky questions about what we were doing with the money we were investing. Why, why were we doing these deals? Why were we investing? And I found my way into impact investing at Prudential, uh, which back then was called social impact investing. Mm -hmm. And uh, my favorite deal to this day is, is, is helping finance a grocery store in Newark, New Jersey, which is the first to go up um, since the, the riots of the 60s. And I still think there are many, many places that don't have a grocery store mm -hmm. and impact investing is a good tool uh, to make that happen. So the light went on for me that finance can be a force for good. Uh, and this was back in the 90s. So now as executive in residence, I have a great privilege to be on call for 150 members of the Minnesota Council on Foundations. I think we have a couple of Minnesota foundations on the call today um, and rural foundations, urban foundations, faith-based, I'm all talking about community foundations. Everyone defines community a little bit differently. Typically it's geographic, but not always. I'm also on call to corporate foundations and private foundations. Uh, my cogent consulting practice and team, we work across the country and help investors implement their strategies so that they can actually invest in line with their values. And I'm so excited to be with the community foundations today because uh, you guys are where it's at. You know, investing in place makes so much sense. And when you think of all the donors who created your foundations, maybe years ago, maybe decades ago, possibly a century ago, they all cared about your place and they invest with you and they continue to invest with you because of the place. And you can give away all your money tomorrow, but you're not going to solve all the problems in your community. So activating your assets mm -hmm. and your donor assets for your mission is really, uh, really my life's passion. Love that. Thank you. I'm glad it is. Stu, hey. how are you? I'm great. How are you? I get to see you next week. I know. I'm looking forward. Yes. Well, tell us about you and what you got going in impact investing. 
Yeah, so I will answer your question in just a moment. One thing I want to say, because we hear about people with financial backgrounds, I don't have a financial background. I, got, I came into this work through social justice, doing civil rights, civil liberties, voting rights, democracy reform, and it led me into a path to community foundations where I've spent about half of my career. So the impact investing is purely a means toward an end. And Susan essentially said the same thing, but she comes in with knowledge of the financial field. I come in with knowledge of how to do things on the ground, but the financing, uh, I became convinced this was a valuable thing. And so mm -hmm. I say that, to encourage those of you who feel like, but I don't understand all the investment stuff anyway. How can I do this new type? You can get help and it's a worthwhile thing to do to make the change you believe in in the community. And, and uh, Christy, you asked a question. So where did the money come from? And, and in the two different community foundations where I have done this, when I was in New Hampshire, we weren't yet doing this work, mm -hmm. but uh, there are two different answers to that in Vermont. As I said, Vermont in 2002, the board said, we're gonna take 5% and keep it in Vermont. That was kind of before community foundations were even thinking about this, frankly, before donor advisors and fund holders were thinking about it. So it's 5% of the overall portfolio from every one of the 1300 funds or however many funds are up there, 5% of everyone is in this. It's kind of a piece of the bond portfolio, but 5% of all, and, and now you don't have to just do bond portfolio, but it's 5% of all the monies are in this investment, which has turned out extremely positive for the Vermont Community Foundation. Here in Delaware, that didn't happen. We didn't really start doing mission investing until the past four years. And all of our mission investments are uh, bespoke products and bespoke activities where we talk to individual donors and we work with them and say, hey, we got this great idea. How about you want to put some of your money in there? Put some discretionary funds in that but the overall portfolio, that's not what that portfolio is used for. We really have to sell. It's retail in that sense. We have to sell each project to get donors to participate. So Stu, talk a little bit more about the differences in those two boards. So, you know, one was willing to take 5% of the overall portfolio. And I guess, what was the donor response to that? Or was there any? Well, and again. Yep. No, please. Well, and you know where I'm going with this. And then, and, you know, yeah. a very different model than in the other community foundation. Well, actually, interestingly, at the time this was done in Vermont, again, before I was there, um, the, the board president was a bank president for a local bank. And he said, hey, we're taking our investments from a local firm that's managing them to a national consulting firm. We have to leave something here for Vermont. Let's say at least 5% stays in Vermont type investment. Mm -hmm. They got no more specific than that, but the board at the time and that board president said, this is a really, we are the Vermont Community Foundation. The money should be working in Vermont. And that was a really important statement at the time. They left it up to staff to figure out how to do that. And for the first decade, it was basically staff working with Calvert Social Investments at the time to figure out what the strategies were going to be. When I came to Delaware, they said, yeah, we've heard about this. We know it's a good thing. We know we should be doing it, but we really have no idea. And the advantage in the case of Delaware is I have been able to do education for the board along the way before we stepped into things. So they're walking in eyes open. I think it's fair to say that the Vermont board didn't really know what they had agreed to. And so we had to kind of go back later and create a task force to help them understand what it was about. They were still very much focused on fiduciary responsibility. We can't do this, even though we were already doing it. Whereas in Delaware, everything we do, they understand that we are allowed to do it. We have an investment committee that's fully understanding of it. And frankly, and this is one of the big differences between today and a decade ago, our investment advisors, our outsourced chief investment officer, has a whole department that does mission investments for all of their clients. That's mm -hmm. not something that existed. So one of our more recent investments, it's a bond, it's a, it's a bond product um, from community capital markets that is doing some really great stuff. They brought it to us. We didn't find it on ourselves. That's really the first time I've seen that happen. So we've got financial professionals who are helping us source these things. And it's just made a big difference in what we have here. And so those investments are all in Delaware. Our impact investments are all in Delaware. Look, we have, 
we have what we call our socially responsible pool, which is kind of a ESG right. pool that people yeah. can choose to put their money in. That money's all over the world, but there are pieces of that that's in Delaware. And then any of the direct impact or mission investments in various projects need to at least have the bulk of their work happening in Delaware. We are an exceedingly tiny state. Most of you have been here, but maybe never stopped. You just drove through on Route 95, going to Philly or New York or DC. But uh, so it's hard to have projects that are stuck in Delaware. We're typically involved in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia as well. Okay, now I'm gonna pick on you for one more minute and then I've got specific questions for um, Deb and Susan as well. When you talked about now, it's donor money. You're having individual conversations with donors who have interest in this. And are they pooling their resources or are they kind of finding well, one-off projects that you're connecting them directly to? Well, there, there are some are one-off projects. I had somebody come to me the other day, of a donor advisor say, hey, do you think we could put this together? So we'll work with him to see if we can actually do that. Other projects, we're going, it frankly, right now, mostly bank CRA officers and private foundations who are saying, let's pool our money. And so we're becoming the hub for groups of people funding different projects. And it, they're, they're putting their money here, comes out of a fund here, but we're serving private foundations and, and banks and a few individual donors. But so we're, so, frankly, Discover Bank is one of our really strong partners. And so they're often coming in and saying, hey, what about this? Could we get people together to fund this kind of thing? And so we'll bring people together and say, would you like to be part of this investment opportunity? Mm -hmm. Deb, you unmuted. Did you want to add something there? Yeah, I wanted to, to, to uh, speak to those two different approaches from just a little different perspective. And, and, and I have two, two smaller community foundations, more rural community foundations in mind, whose first investments before they had policy systems process strategy but mm -hmm. those first investments, um, they were donor driven. Um, and in the case of Hutchison Community Foundation in Kansas, they had an opportunity and they went out and had individual donor calls to try to raise the money they needed because they didn't have a pool. And I think the CEO looked at that as, a, as an approach and said, how do we scale our impact if I, in a small staffed foundation, have to do that every single deal mm -hmm. and was able to bring that sort of knowledge and experience back to the board. She'd been doing the board ed education, Stuart, that you talked about, bring that back to the board and say, if we really want to have an impact, we need to create a, you know, we need a carve out. We need to carve out some of our endowment. So we've got the resources and yes, we can get donors engaged in other ways, but it's not in that intensive deal by deal kind of uh, way. And the Barry Community Foundation in Michigan has done um, the same thing. So I think, I think sometimes you start in one place and then realize that you need to evolve, excuse yeah. me, evolve your program over time. And if, so if I'm real just... quickly, if I'm real quickly, I think getting some of your discretionary dollars in, some of your board directed dollars in becomes really important. We haven't pulled that off here yet, but I expect yeah. within the next year or two, we'll do that too. Mm -hmm. okay. Good point. Deb, can you be specific about that uh, project in Hutchison? What did the project look like? What came to their attention? I want to I want to paint the picture of what what kinds sure. of things this is funding. Um, and and this is a great example, I think, for a community foundation because this was a deal that a, a grantee, a nonprofit housing development uh, organization in in town, came to the CEO and said we need a $250,000 grant to build 16 townhomes and uh, affordable workforce housing in downtown mm -hmm. Hutchison. Totally mission aligned with the foundation, totally out of the realm of their ability to do grants. And the um, CEO said, I cannot make a grant for $250,000. That's beyond our capacity. Why don't you ask me for a loan? And it was a project that the community bank was in and had made a commitment to it, but there was a gap of $250,000, some for the uh, pre-development, some for the construction phase. And the deal wasn't going to go through without the uh, community foundation. And so she went out and got donor resources to come in. They made the loan. Um, it was a two, two different pieces, 250,000. I think it was about two, or two and a half percent interest rate. Um, 
the bank did all of the underwriting and the servicing of the loan because it was a, essentially a participation loan with their community bank. But it, and they got 16 townhomes that are um, constructed in their downtown in a, it cleared a blighted area that they were able to build um, this pocket development. And so it was, it was successful, it was mission aligned, it was with existing partners. It helped, you know, as we talk a little bit about communication, it helped that community bank see that the community foundation was a potential partner and not mm -hmm. competitor. Mm -hmm. um, and that has actually just grown their appetite to, to do that. And they have, um, once they created their, their pool and their carve out, they've done a broadband, rural broadband loan during the pandemic. Uh, they have another uh, loan out there for a boutique hotel in downtown that saves, that will save a historic building. Um, and they're exploring some childcare um, as well. So. And Hutchison is what I would consider to be um, a pretty rural place in uh, in Canada. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. Thanks for being specific with that, sure. Susan. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pivot to you. Um, and well, we had a question in the chat about um, you know what do these look like if they're not loans? You're you're the one that had the grocery store example. What did that one look like? And then I've got more questions for you about partnerships and intermediaries as well. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure they'll like the grocery store example because I was alone. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I, I did see the question in the chat. So what I would um, suggest now is that um, Silicon Valley has finally figured out that, that there's something happening between uh, the coasts and, and that's called business and jobs and, and, and uh, wealth creation. And so there are more and more uh, funds launching in the middle of the country, um, including funds launched by people from Silicon Valley called like Rise of the Rest, but a case fund. A foundation, a community foundation um, can actually invest in those funds um, and make an equity investment out of your endowment. Um, and you can offer that um, participation also to your donors, uh, like how Stuart was talking about. Um, but the example, since um, Christy asked to talk about examples specifically, there are a couple of um, Midwestern focused venture capital funds that have launched in the last few years. Um, one is called Great North Capital and one is called Ever um, Granite Equity, which is an evergreen fund. So Granite Equity was, was founded by a couple of um, guys from Northern Minnesota who were sick and tired of seeing companies launch here and then get bought and, and then moved elsewhere and all the jobs go with it. So their fund only invests in companies that are gonna stay um, in their community in, in Minnesota in this particular. So the community foundations who are focused on economic um, vitality, job creation, I mean, this is a great engine to do that. And so they can, they can actually invest in this venture capital fund. They can make a, they could be a limited partner as long as their investment policy um, allows such investments. So that's an example of a different kind of impact investment. I also saw a question about chat in the chat and those funds can deliver, you know, market rate venture capital type returns. So they're very, could be a very appropriate investment for an endowment. And also you're getting that mission benefit of job creation in your region. So some of these new um, impact funds or not even impact venture capital funds that are place-based, they may not advertise themselves as impact investments, mm -hmm. but when you look at what they're actually doing and, and the metrics they're using for success, it's like job creation, quality of jobs, career ladder, pipeline. A lot of community foundations have have signed up and invested at, at least a bit in um, those kind of venture capital funds. In addition, you asked about the how, since some of the community foundations had not done venture capital type uh, fund investments, they learned alongside uh, some of the private foundations who made investments. Very good. Can I add to that, Chris? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the venture capital, we're, we, in Vermont, we were invested in uh, uh, Fresh Tracks uh, Vermont venture capital firm. And, and that, you know, we got like any investor in that, and that, that was a, a successful program. Vermont Smoke and Cure, some of you may know those little smoked meats, that was one of our companies, that kind of thing, Vermont Teddy Bear. The, the, we've also done an equity investment in a uh, federal credit union. It's, it's actually called secondary capital in their case. 
that will have one percent uh, dividend every year. It actually kind of acts like a loan, but but that is an equity. And then the third one is a far more complicated thing that I mentioned the other day, which is a social impact bond. And I won't spend a long time on that, but we are in one right now. We're going to lose all of our money because <laughs> because of COVID. But be that as it may, that is another way you can do. So so those are just some of the examples. So tell me how you found those and who did the due diligence for you? On the social impact bond, actually, this is, came through a curious way. This, um, our, our local blood bank, which is the Delaware, Maryland blood bank, it was having a real crisis. And this is a true across the country of young people donating blood. And as people age out, they hit 70, they can't contribute anymore, donate anymore. And so they're not getting those numbers replaced. And so uh, they went to a private foundation and said, hey, if you buy us another van to go out on location, we can start to recruit uh, donations of blood. And the private foundation who we had been talking with about social impact bonds came to us and said, what if we turn this into a social impact bond? And so we have the private foundation, Discover Bank, DCF, and the blood bank all agreed on this thing. Social finance, a private consultant talking about different partners, helped draw up the paperwork that we then vetted. And so all, what are we now at, five partners involved with this project to increase, what well, at the time we call millennial blood con unit contributions. And that's, I said, we're gonna lose the money because that project was going great for eight months. And then when COVID came, everything shut down. So we did not include a force majeure in that, <laughs> which was a big mistake because we're stuck to the three-year terms and they got just destroyed because nobody's contributing blood anymore. But that's where that project came from. So, you know, it's they're sourced in lots of different places. And we have, you know, CDFIs or others coming to us and say, hey, do you want, here's the thing I'll say. This particularly happened when I was in Vermont. People got to know we were doing this Mm -hmm. And you will have no shortage of people knocking on your door saying, I got an idea for you. And that's where you need somebody like Susan or Deb or somebody to help you conduct due diligence into vet programs, unless you've got that person on staff. Mm -hmm. So Susan, I want to go back to you a minute um, because you've worked with us here in Des Moines a little bit as we've just started to talk about this. But can, and, and Deb, feel free to interject here as well. Talk about, identifying intermediaries and what that means and, um, and how you can use them to help get started in this? Great question, Christy. I think there are three buckets of intermediaries. I'd start with the CDFIs, uh, Community Development Financial Institutions. If you don't have one in your community, uh, we'll go on to the other buckets, but start with your CDFIs. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, they can be teeny tiny and, and, and just do a few loans, or, or they can be large national organizations. Um, I, we've done a lot of work with Propel for Nonprofits, which is based in Minnesota and makes loans to nonprofits only. We've also uh, seen um, community foundations work with the Community Reinvestment Fund, which happens to be based in Minneapolis, but works across the country, and launched several COVID response funds. Um, particularly in the Northeast on the West Coast, and they're about to do one in uh, Minnesota. So start with CDFIs and the examples there, I would say a best practice is to do a grant along with an investment. So you can do a program related investment into the CDFI and a 20, make 20% 20 um, of a, a grant because they need a grant to reach the kind of borrowers you want them to reach. So the first type of intermediaries I recommend are always the CDFIs. Uh, then you have the various kinds of nonprofits. Uh, there's your local uh, philanthropic association, whether you're in Minnesota, um, Council on Foundations, the National Council on Foundations, but your own local um, site, you can ask your philanthropic network to do educational programming just for your board, for boards or for trustees mm -hmm. or for CEOs. Um, you can ask Mission Investors Exchange. They have a lot of great resources um, and, then, and then peers. So those would be a whole nother bucket of um, nonprofit intermediaries. Um, like, like Deb said, Locus is a nonprofit. There's another one called Sea Change in New York that has launched a pooled PRI fund. So you have all these kind of nonprofits. The third bucket would be financial consultants. As Stuart said, back when he and I were doing impact investing, like no one else was, <laughs> and you really couldn't ask any of the big firms to help you. But now um, you can go to your investment consultant 
whether it's an outsourced chief investment officer or just your investment consultant, um, Cambridge Associates, we've worked with Mercer, we've worked with Crucial, it used to be Colonial. Um, you can ask them about impact investing. In our experience, they know a little bit about impact investing. They might know some of these big place-based um, bond funds like Stuart mentioned, Community Capital Management or RBC Access or Solomon Hess. There's a couple, there's about four we track that are place-based market rate impact investments. But when you start looking at the bespoke kind of very local or very thematic impact investments, the big firms really can't cover those because of the way their economics work. Their economics work if they can um, do diligence and investment and then sell it to a whole bunch of clients. <laughs> it doesn't work for them to find an investment in Fargo, North Dakota for one foundation. Um, so that's where you have to bring in a specialist. Um, that is something, um, there, there are strategic advisors and then there are RIAs, registered investment advisors. They have pros and cons. Um, Confluence Philanthropy has a guide to hiring a strategic consultant. Um, both Locus um, is in there as an RIA and Cogent, my firm is in there too. Mission Investors Exchange, you could go onto their website and look for affiliate members. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can always ask your peers who are doing impact investing, how did, how did you get some help with due diligence? And then you just, just outsource the part that you need. So as a community foundation, you know your community. You don't have to hire someone to do a big six-figure, you know, landscape scan of your town. For mm -hmm. Christ's sakes, you just sit down with 10 people and you probably can write that out. But the financial due diligence is something that's more specialized. So get a get a specialist. Maybe you have a retired banker on your board and they'll do it for you, but um, do get, get that specialist help when you need it. So the three mm -hmm. buckets, go to your CDFIs first, Second would be your philanthropic associations and other types of nonprofits. And third would be your investment consultant. And if they can't help you, they should have a specialist, you know, roster that they can turn on to. Very helpful. Thank you. All right. Deb, did you want to add something before I shift to a new question? Yeah, just, okay. just quickly, two, two things. Um, I, I think from a a co-investor participating investor perspective. I think it's, I mean, we increasingly in the work we're doing in both Indiana and, and Kansas, there just aren't a lot of CDFIs. And so mm -hmm. the community banks, local banks, regional banks, uh, credit unions are really good partners, um, especially for those early, um, the early investments that you might do where you need somebody who can do the the due diligence and um, and maybe put the the loan with the the credit union to begin with or put a deposit at the credit union so that they can um, do some different kind of lending uh, than they might be able to do uh, ordinarily. So I think those are really important partners um, to have those kinds of um, sourcing or or partnership conversations. The, the other thing I would say, I, I think it's really, I mean, th this, there's a, um, there's due diligence that happens on the financial aspects of a deal, but in all of the investments that you're making as community foundations, you are making mission aligned and impact first investments. I mean, that that's what's driving this and you need to be able to do the due diligence on the mission alignment and, and also the impact that's gonna come from this and be able to figure out how do we know that this partner, that, the, that this investee is gonna actually deliver on the, the quality jobs or, or affordable daycare slots or whatever it happens to be. What's the, um, how sustainable is that organization? How aligned with the mission is this organization? Is there going to be any reputational risk from being engaged in this particular deal for you as a community foundation that's been doing this really deep community work for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and built these relationships? How do you make sure that the due diligence process is assessing and, and protecting you against those sorts of, of risks and not just the finance, 
financial. It's a, it's a both and in that context. So just wanted to add that additional color. Excellent. Can Thank I add you. to that comment? Because I think that's so spot on. And if you think about, you know, we go from grants to stock market investments, if you will, and there's a spectrum. And I can't remember originally, I think Ford Foundation hired somebody and they created that spectrum chart from, you know, from that to loans to nonprofits and all across the different things. But it's all using money that makes some kind of impact. The further you are on this end, perhaps it's more directly about social impact. And the further you are on this end, it's more about making the money. And we're trying to blend those a little bit. But to some degree, to Deb's point, it's about making a difference in the community. And so you, you can't view these as two entirely separate games. They're related. They're both about how do I make my difference? It's just different ways of using the money to get there. Excellent. Before we shift gears, Eric. Um, yeah, Chris. Thanks, Christy. I've got some rapid fire questions here in the chat. So Stuart, do you, this is from Katrina. Do you charge a fee to the banks? and private foundations to be a part of the impact investing? If so, what is your approach to setting the fee? Um, usually it, we work it out. I mean, the social impact bond, we got more fee. I don't remember how much we charge, but we talked to the investors and said, we're gonna take, we need to take this much money to make it happen. And ultimately the money comes back into the fund and gets regenerated and that's the whole idea. But in the ones we've been doing here in Delaware, it's about each project we say, okay, and let's pull this much out to pay our fees. We also get separate donations that you know, there's a little bit of a mush in that, oh, here's an annual contribution for all the things we do together, uh, but we charge individually for the projects. And then what are the expected returns for these 5% of funds? I'm going back to Stuart again, so. Uh, this is the 5% of funds in, in the Vermont situation. Um, I'll say in 2008, we got two and a half percent on that, which is why Vermont's returns were better than most people's because we had set aside because they were mostly in loans at that point. So it was a very successful thing. Um, you know, what's different today than was even 10 years ago is you can have market rate investments. I can't tell you what their current strategy is, but, I, but increasingly you don't have to just do CDFIs with one, two or 3% returns. You can be doing uh, direct investments of other sorts, equity investments and get a higher return. And so that's a little bit hard to answer. I would imagine, it, it depends on where you put it in your investment portfolio. If it's part of the bond portfolio, you expect one thing. If it's part of your overall portfolio that you're expecting 7%, you've got to invest it differently. And I'll throw this one out to the group, whoever wants to take it. How do you present total returns when part of your portfolio is invested in these types of below market projects? Happy to take a swing at that one. And Deb, I can add in. Uh, so basically in below market rate products, uh, typically you take that set aside and you take it out of the calculation of return that your investment consultant is responsible for. That doesn't mean they don't... Um, they get out of their reporting responsibility though. Still have them report on them, but mm -hmm. just that the return on the below market rate investments doesn't affect their overall return. So you can monitor that portfolio separately. However, to Stuart's point, when you're doing market rate impact investing, that can be across asset classes. So you can ask your investment consultant to include those investments as part of the return because they should be comparable to the other investments in that asset class. For example, if, you're, if you have a fixed income allocation, your impact investment fixed income can be just part of that. If you have an equity portfolio can be part of that if you have an alternative portfolio. It's really the below market rate that we suggest taking that out because the financial return is one thing, but the social return is why you're doing it to Deb's point. And there is a social return on investment that some investors like to track so you take that out of, of, you don't want to ding your investment consultant's financial returns because of your deliberate use of below market rate impact investing. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. And one more before we turn it back over to Christy here um, uh, from Stratton. What should a community foundation expect for annual cost to pay for a human, pay for human and consultants to manage a small fund of say one to $3 million? Um, Deb or anyone want to take that? Deb, you want to try? We, we, we've been facilitating some circle conversations with community foundations that are practicing local investing. And we, and we just did um, a very quick survey to just try to get a handle on some of the cost associated mm -hmm. with doing this work. There isn't a, it, it would be great if there was an industry wide uh, survey out there and, um, and we, we probably need one. 
at some point, but the for the range of uh, foundations that we interviewed, we we're talking about a half to a full time FTE across that portfolio. Um, and I, you know, so much of it depends upon the size of what you're doing. A one to two million dollar isn't. Um, most of the ones that are in the Indiana foundations that we've been working with are going to be in that range of size. And in many cases, it is existing staff that are simply going to take this on. The due diligence piece of it is, is um, really depend upon the way in which you structure your program and how you source your deals. If you are relying on partnering and, and co-participating with financial institutions who are doing that, the cost is gonna be much less than if you are doing direct investments and you have to go out and pay five, seven, ten thousand $10,000 per investment. And, and um, so it is a, it's a hard question to answer in a really broad way because a lot mm -hmm. of it depends upon the way that you've structured your um, program to begin with. But important you, questions to be asking at the very beginning, I think. Thank you, Deb. I think Susan, you had your hand up. You wanted to I, I think I think somewhere around 1% of the portfolio, um, if you think of what you're paying your managers on your investment portfolio, it's going to be less than that if it's not actively managed, but this is an actively managed portfolio. So that would be consistent with what Deb said ar around kind of 1%. Uh, the due diligence, uh, the way we approach that is in a tiered way. So um, you're not paying the full, you know, whatever, $10,000 for every single investment. What if you don't want to do it? So there's, you know, do a little bit of diligence, have a go, no go. That mm -hmm. costs, you know, $2,500. Do another bit of deeper due diligence, go, no go. You know, so you're only spending money on the deals you actually want to do, which it makes a lot of sense. The other thing we're seeing is foundations share due diligence. And that's a beautiful thing. So get one firm to do it properly, the go, no goes. Um, and then share the due diligence, even share legal templates. The legal costs on this can get very expensive. Um, so we advise engaging legal at the end, not at the beginning. Why do you mm -hmm. want a lawyer billing by the hour for an investment you're not going to do? No, you know, all the love to the lawyers in the room. So we really recommend working together. Again, to my point about CDFIs, which I, I am a big fan, so I'm a broken record on CDFIs. Um, they have these wonderful reports called ARIES reports, A-E-R-I-S. You can buy one. It's a due diligence report. It's like a bond rating, you know, for publicly traded bond, but you can get this ARIES report if they have one. And then the due diligence is done. We know many uh, foundations who rely on the ARIES report, or at least you can use it as a foundation, you know, document and then ask a couple more questions, which aren't going to take you very long. So really share due diligence, only doing the due diligence on the deals you want to do, um, taking advantage of those volunteers on your investment committee or your board um, who want to do this kind of analysis and then hiring out that financial expertise as needed. Thanks, Susan. And now let's go back to Christy and don't forget to add more to the chat. All right. So you talked about the social return. Um, let's talk about how you're talking about this. How are you marketing it, it to your donors? Um, Stuart, you had talked about you know, donors coming together, being interested. You also mentioned that once people hear about this, you know, you're gonna be approached, but how are you marketing the program? Are you marketing the program? What's the storytelling look like? And Deb and Susan, what do you, you know, what do you see in across the community foundation world with this? And Stuart, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think for starters, it, we really try to elevate the individual stories of how investment dollars are making a difference in the community, and that gets donors interested. Uh, additionally, in gatherings of other funders, gatherings of donor advisors, and also with professional advisors, because mm -hmm. one of the things we find is that when professional advisors, whether it's an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor, when they hear about it, that's a story they can then tell their clients that may make their clients more likely to want to put money with us because they see us as a creative problem solver. And so we don't have here, we did this in Vermont, but we don't have it here, like uh, quarterly or annual reports on what's happened to your investments. We did do that in Vermont annually. 
again, can't speak about what they're doing now. I assume they're continuing to do that because I think the program may even have expanded. But an annual report, here's how many housing units, here's how many daycare centers were invested in, here's how, you know, what has happened with the money that you put out. So again, in the form of an annual report. I'll, I'll add, uh, Christy, I think, um, and, and I don't know if Marsha mentioned this last time, but the Topeka Community Foundation does their does an annual donor event. And this year was their opportunity to really speak to their local investing and to tell stories of, of what um, the childcare in East Topeka that, that they did. So I think that those opportunities to really share those stories of impact with donors are really critical to help them see that this is a continuation of your community leadership role as a community foundation, that this is a way uh, to continue to have impact in your community. I think it's also really important for community foundations to, to think about and, and kind of separate out the stakeholders that you need to speak to. I mean, you need to message this to your board in one way. It's around, hey, other people are doing this. Let me tell you the stories. It's having Hutchison Community Foundation come and talk to the Topeka, Topeka board, helping the board members see this as part of their fiduciary responsibility, that they have a responsibility to impact a mission in community. You've got a bunch of community partners out there and the messaging to them is, we now have tools that can help you do your work better, help you do the things that you weren't able to do uh, before. And um, a particularly important messaging, I think, to the financial institutions out there, to local economic development partners, so that they don't, they see the community foundation stepping into their space because this does feel like you're stepping into their space in a really positive way, in a partnership way, um, in a leverage way. So, you know, how can we as a community foundation come in with some capital that will allow the bank to do deals that they may want to do from a community perspective, but just can't do? Um, and then I, is the, the donor conversation. How do you really pitch this to donors so that you don't have donors picking up the phone and saying, what, what's this crazy stuff that you're doing with our, the dollars that we have uh, given you to steward into the future. And you can really make a compelling case for why this is being done uh, today. I think that came up last week as well. Someone had a question in the chat about just the optics and how you, how you handle any um, misunderstanding of that there's a misuse of community assets, for example. Susan. So I had an example of kind of what not to do. And uh, we, we had a community foundation in, in, uh, in Minnesota, which will go nameless, um, that got really excited about impact investing their board. They did the education, they got really excited. Some donors were excited. Um, so they did all this education and they decided to make that part of their strategic plan. And then they announced it and put it on their website. And then they got inundated with every entrepreneur in, you know, in the county who wanted money from the foundation. So my advice is to be um, as transparent as you can be and as clear as you can be. As grant makers, you know, even if you're clear about your specific criteria, you still get um, a bunch of crazy um, requests. But with impact investing, you're going to get more crazy requests because these yeah. are for-profit entrepreneurs, they're also not going to be necessarily as nice and polite and, and respectful of, of, of a grant maker because they don't really know what that is actually. <laughs> so they're going to go after you. And we've seen this happen. So what we recommend is instead be very clear about if you're looking for a grant or you're looking for an investment, if you're looking for investment, click here, then these are what we're looking for and have kind of an automated response. They expect a response immediately. So we, we have seen that kind of, you know, worst case scenario of, of the optics going wrong, but it's very clear to set expectations and be very clear about what you will and won't do. Because if it's on your website, at least you can point to it that like we don't do direct investments into a solar farm you know, in our county, we're not doing that. So you can be clear um, and even have webinars on the topic that, that would help people understand. But communications is a big part of this. I, I would also just it. say I, on the, yeah. No, I'm um, looking at his face and I can tell there's a story, but go ahead. Yeah. 
Well, just on the on the piece about um, your fiduciary duty, I would argue the I would turn that question on its head. If people have given your foundation money to steward for your community, how 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 can you argue that it's okay to do anything but that with the money? Yeah. Um, so it actually is held in a public trust and a tax exempt account to benefit your community. So I think you're, you're on very firm ground there. Anything more to add there? No? Well, okay, we've got 10 minutes left. It feels like there's so much more that we could cover. Um, but I like where you went, Susan, and I'll tell you what not to do. And we did get some questions last time in the chat about, you know, how do, how do you mitigate some of this um, risk? Or what are the things that you've seen that didn't go well and how might have you mitigated it so that those of us who are just getting going in this can consider some of those things. Do you mind if we take a few minutes on that? Uh, who wants to start? On how you mitigate risk for this. Well, yeah, somebody wrote last time, uh, what went horribly wrong and how might you avoid or, or mitigate that? What, you know, what have you seen or what are some of the things that you talked a lot about and are glad you went in a different direction? So let me tell, let me tell a little story. Um, and this will pick up on what Susan said. When you get into the world of direct investments or VC investments, they're, they're people who are not used to playing in the nonprofit world by and large. They're used to raising money, however they can raise money for their projects. And there was a recent project that we only in a glancing way have been involved with. And this is a very cool project, bringing people out of prison and training them to be uh, farmers in, in the, uh, the aqua, I can't, you put it in a building, you know, the, the, the horizontal, the, the vertical. Aquaponics. There you go. Is that it? Yeah. So it's a very cool project and it's kind of not gone terribly well. And the guy who's running it is in it to make money for himself in significant part. And there was, we, as I say, kind of in a glancing way, we've been involved with it, but there were enough people who said, you don't know that you want to get involved with this. And it was a big opportunity zone thing. And people from the Trump administration mm -hmm. came to visit him. And last week's paper, there was a story about four pending lawsuits against him for not paying bills in the front of the paper. We didn't get in that. We almost did. And I'm so glad we, oh, yeah. we listened to the advice of people who both knew the individual, but also saw what was going on and said the numbers aren't stacking up right, speaking of vertical farms. So, so <laughs> how, do you, how do you mitigate? I think get good advisors around you who really give you uh, strong advice on these things mm -hmm. and look closely at the numbers if you don't know how to do them and look closely at the mission if, if uh, you need somebody to help you with that. Mm -hmm. If I can add, Christy, I would just piggyback on that, especially if it's a deal in your town and you know the people and your board and people are getting excited about this project. It's really important to have someone who can be objective and give you the straight shot. And maybe yeah. the due diligence advisor will tell you, as we just told a, a client, um, that deal is not an investable deal. Like we, in our view, you're, you're not going to get your money back. Now they decided to proceed, but they're going to budget a hundred percent loss internally. So you can still do the deal. You just just know your from your your independent objective financial advisor is saying you're probably not going to get it back. Maybe, you know, maybe you will, maybe you won't. So maybe you budget fifty percent against it. But due diligence is important, especially now. In a way, those of us in the nonprofit sector are kind of sitting ducks because impact investing has gotten so popular, and we're in it for all the right reasons for for a mission. So we have to bear in mind that the person on the other side of the table may not be in it for those reasons. And, you know, a trustee of a community foundation called it. He told me a few years ago, it's only a matter of time till there's a Bernie Madoff of impact investing. And we do have that now. Um, so, so due diligence is, is important. It doesn't have to be exhaustive or expensive, but pausing to look at the facts mm -hmm. of the deal is, is really important, especially right now. Mm -hmm. Good point. Deb, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, just, um, I'll, I'll give a, a different kind of example about choosing your partners. <laughs> and uh, again, I, I won't name the foundation, but um, foundation that got well along the way 
with um, a possible with a potential investment in a downtown area, only to have the economic development corporation kind of come in and blow up the deal. And part of it was uh, again, there's there's a lot of relationship building that needs to be done um, between community foundations who are when you start to do investing, you're starting to be in the realm of economic development. And there's a whole set of people whose lives and livelihoods and professions and reputations are dependent upon this being what they do. And especially in smaller communities, I think those, those lines can be pretty well drawn. And I think recognizing that you're gonna need to, to understand all the players that are, that are going to have to come together. It may have nothing to do with a particular deal, but it could be with, with zoning or regulations or just the local political will to have something happen in the community. And so I, I think it was a, a real cautionary tale. It didn't stop this foundation. It stopped them from that deal, but it didn't stop them from pursuing this uh, longer term. Excellent. Well, we are running out of time. I'm gonna ask for one final thought or comment, just tell me, what has been the highlight for you as you've tackled impact investing as briefly as you can? Susan, you were the first to unmute. Highlight to me is combines, uh, combining investing for good in place and investing for good with gender and, and uh, race and equity issues. This is where these things really come together. You really can do good well. And for foundations, it's hard to figure out how to engage a small business in the private sector. So seeing community foundations step up and invest in CDFIs who can then loan to small business so that there's some protection for the community foundation. I just, I've loved that in the last year and a half with the, with the crises we've all had with this pandemic, with George Floyd being murdered in Minneapolis, it's been a really, you know, just a very personal and difficult time for us. And seeing our foundations, particularly our community foundations, with the donors step up and say, what can I do? I mm -hmm. see that we have racial injustice in our community. What can I do beyond grant making? I mean, keep doing the grants, but what else can I do with my donor advised funds at the community foundation? So we've seen money just pour into the community foundations with these donors, and they're eager and excited to see it do more and make a bigger difference and do things differently because let's face it, what we've been doing hasn't solved the problems of poverty and racial inequality and injustice. So I'm just ex so excited to see um, community foundations step up and lead in this way. That's awesome. Thank you, Deb. I, I, I would say it's seeing a growing number of community foundations really recognizing that they're going to have to activate all their assets in order to really move into that transformational change, not just mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the symptoms of issues that exist, but really understanding the systemic challenges that their communities face and putting all of their assets to work uh, to address them. And, and seeing small foundations, large foundations, you know, seeing foundations in all kinds of places stepping into that community stewardship role is just really exciting for me and the fact that it's a growing movement um, over time. So it gives me a lot of hope for the future. I love that, activate all of our assets. I'm writing it down to make transformational change. That's great. Stu. Yeah, when I mean, at the very top level, of course, it just expands our impact. It gets us into a lot of interesting economic development questions. But I think more importantly, it speaks to community foundations being responsive to changing times and distinguishing ourselves from other institutions and saying, we're here for good forever, if you will, but we'll do that in the way that suits the times most appropriately. And right now, impact investing is a growing way to have bigger impact. And as community leaders, it's, it's appropriate for us to be showing that we can do it and we can distinguish ourselves by being available for whatever the community needs at the time. So that's what excites me. 
perfect final thoughts from all three of you. Thank you so much. Thanks to the Council of Foundation on Foundations for partnering with um, CEO Net, CFCEONet.org is where you can learn more. Eric, thanks for partnering with me on this. And we hope to bring you one more roundtable um, by the end of the year. So we'll just see how that all pans out and we'll let you all know. And don't forget, you can join us in planning. Uh, we'd welcome more help. So just reach out to any of us. And um, Susan and Deb Stewart, thank you so much for making time. And it was just great. We'll get the recording out to everybody. Take a quick bathroom break and on to your next meeting. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Christy, Eric, thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>